Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Peter Orner in support of Maggie Brown and others in conversation with Kevin Smokler this evening. Uh, some Zoom etiquette. You heard me as you were joining us, but just a reminder, we do ask that you keep your video off for the duration of the event. You're muted. You'll remain muted. Speaker view is probably the ideal way to uh, experience um, the the event this evening. That way you will just see whoever is speaking on your screen and not a grid of blocks. Um, the chat is also closed for public chatting, but you might want to keep the chat window open. Um, that way I can send you links to purchase Maggie Brown and others from Literati Bookstore. And you can send me questions you might have for our author. Whenever the spirit moves you this evening, feel free to submit questions into the chat window. I will ask a selection of them at the, con at the conclusion of uh, Peter and Kevin's conversation. As a reminder, you can purchase Maggie Brown and others from Literati Bookstore on our website. I'll drop a link in the chat. If you're watching later on YouTube, there will be a link in the description below. And you can shop for uh, more books at literatibookstore.com. Thousands of titles from our store are available for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan. And in lieu of book purchases, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. Whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can donate at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this afternoon or this morning, depending on wherever in the world uh, or when in the world you are tuning in from. So without further ado, I'll introduce our author and moderator, Peter Orner, two-time recipient of the Pushcart Prize, is the author of five previous books, including the novel Love and Shame and Love and the collection Esther Stories, a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award. His memoir, Am I Alone Here, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. His fiction has, has appeared in The Atlantic, The Paris Review, Tin House, and Granta, and has been anthologized in the Best American Short Stories. The recipient of the Rome Prize, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a Fulbright to Namibia, Orner holds the Dartmouth Professorship of English and Creative Writing at Dartmouth College. And Ann Arbor native Kevin Smokler is a writer, director, uh, documentary filmmaker, excuse me, and host with a focus on popular culture. He's the author of the books, Brat Pack America, the essay collection, Practical Classics, and the editor of Bookmark Now, Writing in Unread and Readerly Times. His essays and criticism have appeared in the LA Times, Salon, Fast Company, and on National Public Radio. In 2020, he directed the documentary film, Vinyl Nation, about the comeback of vinyl records in America. Please join me in using your Zoom uh, clap reactions to welcome Peter and Kevin into your living rooms. Thanks so much, everybody. Peter, great to see you, man. It's, it's, been, it's been too long since we lived in the same town. I know, Kevin, it really yeah. has been, but it's yeah. great to see you in, in your natural habitat. Thank you. You too. I, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to sound terrible if I walk around the way you're walking around. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to stay put. I have enough trouble shaking around as it is. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about Maggie Brown and get into depth with with some of your other books. Um, and John, maybe I don't know. I, I have a feeling Peter and I are, are are gonna are gonna be having a lot of fun here, and try and keep it entertaining for everybody listening. So maybe maybe if you just give us a hands up or a private message when it's time for us to take questions from the audience. Thank you. Um, because I, I don't want I don't want Peter and I to get lost talking about you know Michigan football or you know long afternoons browsing at Literati and or the Borders books of old and stuff like that and not and not take into account that we have an audience here with us. Um, Peter and I both have a history with Ann Arbor. Peter went to Michigan, right? Um, I did. Yeah. 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 And I and I my parents went to Michigan and I grew up in Ann Arbor. So uh, and we both miss it a lot. Um, so I'm really glad we got a chance to talk about this. I want to start kind of at the beginning. I've got my, I've got my, my Peter Orner library right here. Um, I'm a couple of volumes short. I got I got I gave, I gave my Esther stories to someone as a gift. So I got to re up on that. Um, but my Maggie Brown here, um, the thing I, I have this, I have this totally unfounded fantasy about how fiction writers start books. Uh, I have this, this idea that you finish the last one and like, you know, you're like, you're like taking a, taking a breath or getting an omelet or something. And then you're like, hmm. And then like the waitress name is Maggie Brown and you're like, aha, and here we go. <laughs> so I'm guessing that, I'm guessing that was not the case because it's my fantasy. And so I'm curious to know, like from the end of the previous book to the beginning of Maggie Brown, tell us that story. 
boy. Uh, well, first of all, thanks, thanks, Kevin, for, yes. for for agreeing to do this. And John at, at Literati, it's uh, you know what a great store. And I'm you know I wish I was in Ann Arbor. Uh, I had such great times there. And and it's funny you mentioned. I mean that the the, uh, the title story is set in Ann Arbor. Maggie Brown's set in Ann Arbor, and I think it's the only story in this um, collection that is. Um, but, you know, I think, I mean, between your books, Kevin, you probably have the same feeling. There's a feeling of sort of like, you know, can you do this again? Why would you want to do it again? Why would you put yourself through this again? You know, and, and I think years go by and then you find yourself with a few pages and then a few more pages and 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 you realize that, you know, holy shit, it, it, it seems to be happening again. And uh, that's kind of how um, this book, I mean, I'm wary of writers talking about this kind you know what I mean? Ah, like man. sounding like a complete moron, but, but I, I, I mean, this one came, uh, 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 differently than others in the sense that I had a lot of stories that I hadn't finished and a, a number of them over a course of many, many, many years. And I decided, Oh, I'm going to finish some of those stories I hadn't finished. One of the, one of the stories in here, I started in 1999. Um, and so, you know, it's uh, 20 years it took me to finish it. And, uh, you know, so, so that was sort of the genesis of this is that it, I realized that, that I had a lot of unfinished things. And, and, and that was sort of the, um, I realized if I just did that all day long, you know, when I could, uh, I would start to have something start, would start to take shape. And um, so that's how, this, that's how this one came. And was that a different process for you? I mean, did uh, for your other books, did you sort of did you sort of start at the trunk and say and, and work your way back and say it'll be an elephant one day? Uh, where in this case, you have like a tusk and a tail and an ear, and and and, and eventually it'll be an elephant. Like, I, I think they always come haphazardly. I just think that <laughs> they come differently haphazardly. You know what I mean? I never quite. I wish I. I'm trying to do that right now. It's not working. You know, I'm like, okay, today I will begin. And then, you know, in eight weeks, I'll see, I'll, I'll have written a third. It just, it doesn't quite work that way with me. I, I, I try and be disciplined and organized. And um, you can tell, well, I can't, you can't tell by my boring seeming house, but uh, there's, uh, there's no discipline and organization in my life whatsoever. And therefore, um, these things come chaotically. Yeah. And so I think the, all, the other ones did too, <laughs> even the novels, which are chaotic novels. So, yeah. My favorite thing about this particular book of yours, and, and I'm, this is going to sound trite and I don't mean it that way, is the, is the economy and the eloquence um, in, 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 in terms of how the stories, you know, reach a beginning, middle and end in like three to five pages. Like, um, I, I, I think there's, there's, there's a fair amount of that in your other books. Like, like the chapters in Love and Shame and Love are, are pretty short also. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also like clearly a, um, I, I mean, I feel, like, I feel like your books are like, are, 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 there's something a little grand and banquet-like about them. And so I'm like, all right, listen, I, I better wear my eating pants, <laughs> my good shoes, and you know I'm gonna be here a little while, and I'm ready for it. But it's not, but it's not corn chips. It's like you know, it's um, it's a big meal. And I feel like I feel like Maggie Brown could be corn chips or a big meal. Um, it, 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 it maybe it's individually corn chips and collectively a big meal. I, I'll take either. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I'll take side dish, main main course, yeah. appetizer. You know, snack in the middle of the night. Uh, you know. I'll take it as it comes. And I, 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 I'm always sort of after a certain economy. I think that is important to me. I don't, I don't know where I got that value from, but I, I don't like to waste a lot of words, but at the same time, I think I do strive for a certain density of a story. I was thinking on the way, um, there's a big storm here in Vermont tonight and, uh, uh, I was caught in the rain, but I was thinking about you and thinking about talking to you. And I was just thinking about to myself, like stories are, a very strange thing. I, I was thinking like, there's tons of stuff written about like the history of the novel, right? Very little about the history of the short story in, in terms of a trajectory. And I think the reason for that is not to be all luxury here, but that there isn't, that stories really do kind of come haphazardly and history of the short story can't be sort of tracked in any way. There are these very, individual things and so um i really like to be part of that tradition uh and so i don't know where i got that idea 
in terms of your question, <laughs> but I had something to say about that. It seemed to relate in the sense of that's why I'm, I'm looking for a new way of telling something, I guess. So I, th I think of two things when I think of Maggie Brown and, and, and by the way, I realize I got into this and, and we were talking, uh, we were talking earlier about Peter reading something like Peter, you interject if you want to read something or maybe we'll conclude with you reading something. Sure, yeah, and, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Great, great. Uh, um, Maggie Brown makes me think of two things. One, um, because the stories are all, um, all sort of start from different places um, and, and are seemingly unconnected to one another, uh, I, get, I get a kind of Donald Barthelme feeling from this. There's a lot of, there's a, there's a, sort, of, there's a sort of collection of ideas on the table um, that are complete, but, but it's kind of up to you to, see, to, to ask why they're all on the same table. Um, and then because I'm a nonfiction writer, it has a, it has a new journalism quality to me. It has, a, it has a, a sort of classic new journalism quality where, you know, Tom Wolf doesn't, doesn't know how to finish a piece for Esquire. And so he just hands in the notes and that's the story. Um, right, right. Um, I think, but I think you make I a like really, yeah, I, I think you make a really good point that like, if you take new journalism, it's very, I, I was able to draw up that anecdote, not because I'm an expert on new journalism, but because the history of it is very enshrined and mythologized. Whereas right. like the history of great short stories, you're right, is murky. Is it, there's, there's, I mean, we know where some of them come from. We know that, that, you know, apparently like, like Shirley Jackson came home from a grocery shopping trip with her kids and like, and someone had uttered an anti-Semitic remark at her kids and she came home and wrote up the lottery that was later found out to be largely myth but like but that was that was a story that came with its own origin and, and that is I, rare I, I i i live in a town that literally the lottery if if that was a tradition they would do it i mean like that's how <laughs> new england it's just like well you got to kill somebody this year that was, that's how it is <laughs> yeah uh, I, I, I agree there. I mean, that's that anecdote about Shirley Jackson is exactly kind of what I'm talking about. Like that story, which is, you know, one of our most kind of iconic, famous stories in American literature. It happened because somebody was, well, the story is not even true, which I love yeah. even more. The fact that there's fiction about the fiction, but that, that you can't track that in sort of any sort of rational kind of, I, I guess a professor can't get hold of it and be like, mm -hmm. see how stories are developed right? But you give a professor an idea about uh, the development of the novel and they'll tell you all kinds of bullshit. So, and I'm, I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people. So I know. Yeah. It's interesting. Like, 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 like you don't, you don't take the yellow wallpaper and say, well, here, here are the architectural plans for it in Charlotte Perkin Gilman's archive. And, and therefore, you know, and therefore we know exactly where the idea came from. Right. Um, the, uh, I want to I want to talk about the fact that both of us have a long-standing relationship with Ann Arbor, um, and and that speaks to something that I really like and admire about your work in that it's very it's very tied to specific places, uh, and and not just the work like last car over the Sagamore Bridge, which refers to a specific, the title of which refers to a specific place. But I remember when it, when you and I had lunch many years ago, and and and. I think you were just putting kind of the finishing touches on love and shame and love. And you were like, this is my Chicago book. Like, I remember, I remember you saying something of that kind. Can you tell me about place and, 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 and the role you see it playing in your work? It, 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 I remember that lunch. I think Jason Roberts was with us too. Uh, Thanks, uh, it all starts with place. I can't, I mean, that's the one kind of constant in my haphazard methodology that I can pinpoint like literally I know that I, I don't start any story without a notion of the geographic location. And even if, I, if, in, even if it's unstated, it is in my head, I see it. And so, you know, Maggie Brown starts it in, in uh, West Berlin in Bolinas, um, north of San Francisco. And that felt like the right place to begin. Uh, and of course, and then it bounces all around, you know, California, Chicago, East Coast, um, Fall River, Massachusetts, where my mother is from and my family's from. And so I think I have a lot of um, personal relationships to places in this book and, and others too. I, I have certain attachments. So Chicago returns here 
Um, I lived in California, as you know, for you know, 20 years almost. And uh, I never really wrote much about California until, you know, not surprisingly, until I left when suddenly I was in mourning, you know. I'm in mourning, especially lately because the fires and just, you know, I just, it's just wild to, um, I'm so sad to watch what's going on in Napa right now. So, um, yeah, I, I think for me, it's always, it's always linked in, to a certain extent to place. And then I'll play with the story and figure out what it's about. But if, if I know where it, I know, if I know where it's, um, if I know where it's set, I can, I can usually uh, put down a few words. And you are, you are a Midwesterner like me, and, uh, and you've spent a bunch of time in Northern California, like I have. Uh, I'm, I'm still there. And now you're a, a New Englander. Um, yeah. How would you, have each of these places shaped your work differently, or do they kind of cast a collective spell over it? Uh, I just, I never had, I never thought of my, I mean, California was where I, where I wrote everything. And so really, like, I, now more than ever, I parade around as a Californian in my mind. You know, I follow, I'm constantly worried, worried, wondering what's Gavin Gavin doing, I can't believe Gavin's governor, but you know what I mean? Like I, I, I so yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, my roots are in Chicago, but my, you know, my, uh, my, my life up until very recently was uh, in a city that, that, that wasn't mine, that took me in and uh, you know, I have great affection for, um, for uh, San Francisco in particular. And I, I feel like that's where my roots are and, you know, now being in New England, which is new to me, but my mother's from here. I'm, I'm getting used to it. It's not easy, uh, but uh, I'm doing the best I can. I live in a pretty hilarious town. As I said, the lottery could take place here for sure. <laughs> Except now it's on the listserv. Now it's on like the town. The lottery is taking, takes place online. There's like that, there's stonings online. Like that's how people yeah. are here. So, um, you know, you know how it is. But uh, uh, I'm getting used to it. I'm getting used to the, um, the life here. Uh, one of my favorite stories in Maggie Brown is um, is uh, it, it's called a poet dies in Bolinas and um, and I, I remember I remember seeing it in the table of contents first when I was reading the book and then coming upon it it's like a poet and I think it's called an old poet dies in Bolinas and I remember seeing the title and being like being like. I'll read it because it's Peter and I love Peter's work, but that, that's kind of it, right? Like it's all there in the title. Like, like it's like, it's like death of a salesman. Do I really need to get to the last act to see that <laughs> Willie Loman is going to keel over and, and croak? Like, I mean, it's not a metaphor. Like, like it actually fair, happened. Fair point. For sure. Yeah. Um, but I, I love that story because it almost feels like the challenge of it was to be like, here, can I reveal everything that happens in the title and then like still keep you interested? Like, but that's probably my interpretation. I'm more interested in, I'm more interested in, 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 um, in hearing what you, in hearing what you have to say about that particular story. You know, my old, my old teacher, Andre Debus, um, uh, uh, not to be confused with Andre Debus the third, who's a, a friend and, but I'm talking about his father, the great uh, short story writer, Andre Debus was my teacher. Uh, for many years. He, he once told me something along the lines of, it's okay to give everything away in the first line, because then that's when the story starts getting written. Like, yeah. it, you know, the old poet's dying. Okay, now what? <laughs> you know, who is he? What's that like? You know, and I, I, think, I, I think I do that, uh, you know, not infrequently in sort of in honor of Andre. Uh, and, uh, you know, that story um, came I worked in the, I was a volunteer uh, firefighter in West Marin in Bolinas. And, you know, I met, a, I mean, in Bolinas, you, you can't go far without running into a poet. Um, I used to have, you know, Robert Creeley lived there, all kinds of old, old school poets, Joanne Krieger. And anyway, it's just a place where poets settled back in the day. Mm -hmm. And there are still some of them still left. And uh, what started to really interest me is what would it be like to devote yourself, your entire existence, to something that you weren't necessarily that good at. <laughs> in fact, you weren't even that good at all, but, it, but you loved it. What if you were a, a poet? You, you can be a poet. Like you can be a poet without being a great poet. There was something I really loved about this particular person who I met in Bolinas that wasn't a great poet, but damn right he was a poet. You know, and uh, I, I, I have a great deal of respect for someone to hang in there that long. Um, and so that's kind of what that was about. I mean, there, 
you know, the San Francisco beat poet, poets, which this guy was one in real life and then my fictional version of him. You know, I, I think that there, um, there were a lot of those people that made the movement, not just the famous ones, you know, and, and, and this is a guy who was there when it all happened, but his poems aren't necessarily memorable. Maybe I'm being too hard on his poetry. Yeah, uh, I mean, but hell, the story doesn't have to be about him. The story, the, no, I, I, I think the question that you began with in, in that story is a really interesting one. And I, I really like fiction that uh, kind of starts from that place. Uh, uh, I, I once saw an interview with Steven Spielberg where he said, where he said, oh, I, I always start with a question and then it's just the screenplay that fills the question. Like, like he said, like E.T. wasn't, wasn't about an alien at all. I, I had this question where I was like, like, what does it take to fill the heart of a lonely child? And then like the screenplay to E.T. walked in the door eventually and answered that question, um, which I think is fascinating. Yeah, um, we, have a, we have someone in the chat asking if you could move your microphone a little bit closer to your mouth so, oh, we can, sure, so, yeah. so folks can hear that, you. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, uh, we'll, have John, we'll have John weigh in if that, if that solves the uh, sound, sound issue, no problem. Okay, great. Um, tell me, uh, tell, so tell me about, um, I, I, I was, I was the other favorite thing that I think that the stories in this collection do, and, and we should say there's, there's four sections of stories, about a half, six to nine a piece, and then, um, and then a novella at the end. But the novella, is, the novella is divided up into short episodic scenes. It almost feels like a collection of stories itself, but they're all, but they're all sort of featuring, the same, featuring a central character and, and, and the people in his life. Um, the, uh, the th one of the things I noticed you do is is there is a there is a a beginning that is very much connected to like items two and nine in the two through nine in the story, and then item ten takes you somewhere completely different. Like you get to the very end and it takes you, it reminds me a little bit of Mary Oliver's poems where it's like, where it's like the whole thing is about a pond on a summer day. And then in the last three lines, you're like, no, no, it's not. It's about death. Like, like um, there are, it is still about a pond on a summer day, but it's also about death. Um, tell me about, I guess I'm asking a question about endings and, 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 and what you, what you like, how, how, how do endings speak to you and what you like to do with them? Uh, I think a lot about this <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think they always have to be different. You can't, you know, you gotta be very aware of, you know, not making the same move more than once, but, but I think as a general idea for me, and I like, I, I, I wish for an ending that, um, where a, a reader can feel a sense that the story's not over, that in like a, a free fall like there's the emotion continues that's what i that's what that's what i strive for um and you know sometimes that works better than times than others but i i i um my stories tend to be short not not all the time there's a you know, 25 page story in here and there's a novella like you say but i do like to the idea that even if something is short it continues that's my that's my hope yeah um, there, when this book came out, this is, this is your sixth book, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I, I, I believe there was a profile of you in the New York times that said to the effect, finally, Peter Orner gets the respect he deserves, <laughs> which, <laughs> which was, which is, which is sort of nice on its face, but it also reminds me of that thing that Cheryl Strayed said when Wild came out, where she's like, listen, like, takes a lot of work to get to this point. And so just because you've never heard of me doesn't mean like I fell from the sky with a copy of Wild in my hand. Like I, I um, so I mean, I, I, I think there is, there is putative praise in something like that. And, um, and with the way that this particular book has been received, but I, frankly, I'm more interested in hearing about it from your point of view than the New York Times's point of view. And, you know, and as somebody who read Cheryl's uh, work before Wild, uh, you, you know exactly right. She was working very, very hard long before that, and and you know, it, I think you hit it. You know, it's you know we're out here working, and and you know whether or not people um, know that uh, at, at a certain point or not, 
isn't isn't really the isn't really the point of certainly you know why I do it. I I, I just I, I've always felt in this, um, and, I, and my first book came out more than twenty years ago. Uh, I've always felt like if I could just stay in it, if I could just keep my head above water and write another story that maybe somebody will read. That's always been, you know, I, I, and maybe to my detriment, I don't know, but the idea that I, I you know, I just wanted to hit 300, you know, to use a, 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 a lame sports metaphor apologies, but you know what I mean? I just wanted to keep, remember Paul Molitor? Remember yeah. that? Yeah. Let me, like, you know, like a hitter like that, Tony Gwynn. Maybe that's maybe that's reaching, but uh, but you know I just that's that's what I'm after is just the ability to keep doing this, and I feel very um, frankly extremely grateful that I still can because it's you know um, a lot of artists and writers and you know for whatever reason aren't able to keep doing things mainly economic reasons, and you know I teach to make a living. Uh, uh, for the most part, and I'm grateful that I'm able to do that because it gives me time to work, you know, and as well as many other things that come with that, including including great students. I'm going to try and probably fail to tie, to tie together about four things you said there <laughs> in, into my next question, which are a. If anybody does not know who Paul Molitor is, Paul Molitor was a third baseman for the Milwaukee Brewers, who <laughs> instead of being great, was good year after year after year. Um, was you know? good for, yeah, for like 25 years and, and longer than practically anybody playing the game and was never flashy and was never dating celebrities or anything like that. Was just good over and over in and over again. In Milwaukee. And in Milwaukee, yeah. And now, and then. He dated celebrities in Milwaukee. Exactly. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe like, like an heir, an heiress to the Miller right, beer the <laughs> yeah, or something yeah, like that. Exactly. Uh, um, but like, and then he retired and he got into the baseball hall of fame, like his first year out because like everybody respected Paul Molitor, even though he was the very antithesis of flash. Um, and I think that's a really good example. Um, I think about, I, I think about like, like the fact that so much of your career is about, uh, it, it is, is about identifying oneself as both a reader and a writer. Like you've actually published a, you've actually published a, a a whole a whole collection about about reading am i alone here which is which is a great book about one of my favorite books about about reading actually um and as i like to say like and i think i, I there's a lot of this in am i alone here too if you know the backstory the complete story of of a writer or anyone who creates something you like the work and the right, it's, it is always more interesting. It is always more interesting to know the backstory than to think that that person, you know, like dropped from the sky holding a copy of Wild in their hand. Um, I, you know, it, it complicates it a little bit, but like I, I think it's, you know, to know that, to know that, um, Harper Lee took took the first draft of of To Kill a Mockingbird because she thought she was going nowhere with it and flung it out a window into the snow on you know on a, on a New York winter's night and her roommate her her friend who she was living with went and scooped it all up and rescued it and said please don't right. stop all those I mean, wet pages yeah, yeah all those yeah. wet pages like that's like I, I'm not saying that like that enriches the, the the text itself but it's like it it, it tell it it, it changes. It deepens our appreciation of Harper Lee, not only as an artist, but as a person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I guess starting from Paul Molitor and, and ending here, <laughs> this is this is a long way of saying like, like, how do you how do you uh, uh, marry the idea of of being both a writer of fiction and and, and an appreciator of fiction? Someone sitting on sort of the opposite end of that the, the other end of that exchange. Uh. I'm, I'm just glad you know who Paul Monitor is. Paul Monitor is. I appreciate that. Uh, but I, I would say that, that I, you know, if I could do one thing in the world, it wouldn't be right to write. It would be to read, you know, in addition to the, you know, being with my kids and my family, that's it. And they would say, you'd just rather read than be with us. But that isn't true, everybody uh, who might be listening or maybe not. Um, I, you know, I, I just, it's just always, my first love it's what I, I love to do and i you know i start the day reading and if i get it into writing i will and you, most of what i write it really is either a direct or indirect response to 
you know, to something that's triggered by, uh, by reading. It's just always, always been that way. And I, what I realized, I guess, in the book that you mentioned, um, Am I Alone Here? I, I thought I was having a lot of trouble writing fiction th those years. And uh, I realized that just in order to keep the pen moving, you know, cause I, I tend to write by hand mostly. Um, I, I, uh, I just kind of riffed off things I had read and I still do that. And I do that every day now. Um, and, you know, if I can get to fiction and if I can get in the right brain space, if I can concentrate hard enough, you know, that's obviously what I'm going to try and do. But, um, you know, I just, I, 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 I get a great deal. I, I feel like, I mean, I just feel like reading intensely is like, it's like you get to, you get to be in the world, which is great usually or not depending. Uh, and then you have this alt it's, you know, like, I mean, I'm not saying anything no one's helps has said before, but you know, it's kind of, you get to like alternate reality. I'll be sitting with my kids while I'm reading and I'm like, wow, I can be in this world and this world. And, and it's, you know, there's a certain, I still am excited. I'm still excited. I'm still excited to go into Illuminati and, and, you know, and find stuff I haven't found, you know, and, and I hope to never lose that. Yeah. I mean, so, so, under normal circumstances, this being almost the beginning of October, you would probably be spending a fair amount of time in a classroom with, with, um, with, with kids eighteen to twenty-two or twenty-two to twenty-five who, who, like uh, that, yeah. who are who are interested in in uh, in becoming fiction writers themselves, and and we can presume have an appreciation uh, for reading and literature. Um, but this is, you know, this is this could seem to to a casual observer like a deeply anti-liberal arts time in our history. So I'm wondering what, what it's like from, from your point of view as an educator of, of fiction and literature, um, especially, uh, uh, and, and especially like what, 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 what you see in, in your students. I, I mean, are they all the same? Are they all, are they all people who like wrote for their high school literary magazine or are they, um, what, what do they look like? You know, they're all different, obviously, you know, um, what what I think is oh, a good story is always going to be transformative, I think. And so whether or not people are ready for it or whether or not the right moment, you know, I just feel like every, you know, if I give them a good story, you know, I give them Sonny's Blues, you know, James Baldwin, yeah. it'll break through. It'll break through their screen addiction. It'll great break through their 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 their, you know, rightful obsession with politics at the moment. And, and suddenly they will be with this guy and his brother, you know? And, and I, I feel that that, you know, I, I, it works every time. And, you know, you, you know I teach at, at Dartmouth College. There's a certain uh, amount of privilege that, that comes with uh, being here, but also there's a, a, a great deal of, and increasingly so, and needs to be even more, frankly, Dartmouth. Uh, uh, but there's a, a great deal of diversity within the classroom at this point. So when I look out at my 12 students, um, I'm not seeing any kind of sameness. I'm seeing, you know, a great deal of um, individuality. And uh, that said, that said, I will say, and Kevin, I'm sure you, this is something you think about. Um, you know, the thrust to, in, in, in liberal arts and humanities towards, you know, uh, well, how are you going to make a living from that, right? And so I find myself, I used to teach at San Francisco State in the MFA program. I didn't have this, I didn't have to justify like my entire existence. But here, sometimes I, I, I have to answer to parents and, and, to, and to students who, who genuinely don't understand why anybody would spend the time that I spend talking about short stories and novels and literature in my classes. And you know, again, that's not to say when I get them, they're not going to be on board because they are when I get them. But for the most part, what are they seeing? If they major in econ, they're going to this result. If they major in computer science, they're going to this result. If they major in, in, you know, in finance, this result. Major in English, major in creative writing, what result? You know, and, and, and I, I resent having to sort of play that game but unfortunately sometimes i find myself having to say well you could write for tv you know write for the movies you can make a lot of money right um you know the fact is you don't do this for that you just don't you don't become an english major because you want to get rich no 
No, I, I, I like to keep a short, I, I, I delivered the, the sort of pre-graduation address at my Ann Arbor High School a few years ago. Oh, and, cool. uh, and I had to, and, and one of the things like, yeah, I, I, was, I was a writing seminars major at Johns Hopkins and Stephen Dixon was one of my teachers. And, um, and I, I, I definitely Stephen had, Dixon. yeah, I, RIP. And I, I definitely had to be, I, I remember I was about to talk to a bunch of parents who are going to send their kids off to presumably like, you know, not cheap universities. And I remember I had to say, I remember I, I, I came up with a short list of names of people who had accomplished great things and had been philosophy majors. <laughs> um, and and these, this is a good thing to carry around if you believe in this kind of stuff. You know, you know, John Elway was a philosophy major and Sally Ride was a philosophy <laughs> major. Thurgood Marshall was a philosophy major. <laughs> so like now, these are- Now we're talking. I mean, yeah, Elway, so, I, I, what kind of philosopher was John Elway? But, but you see what I mean though? Sometimes I, I totally, agree with you but i but i do sometimes get a little chafed that i have to that you need know. a john elway yeah, yeah. exactly or, or or you know or, or harrison ford was he went to waldorf he didn't even you know what i mean it's just like we shouldn't have to do that literature is too big for that yeah it's too great for that but yeah. but again i i get it i get it and you know we gotta we gotta you know there's a certain self perpetuation that unfortunately um it comes into play because we need we need the students yeah yeah and and like i you know i'm not a i'm not a parent like i'm not a parent who has to send a kid to a i i can only imagine what college is going to cost when your kids get to be that age but like yeah. i uh you know i i don't have to we don't have to rationalize that yet but like right. it's one of those right. things where it's like i i like i like to say i like to say like culture leads and politics follows. And maybe that's an appropriate thing to say, uh, you know, on the okay, eve of yeah. the presidential debate. But like, there's no, there's no civil rights movement without the jazz age and without James Baldwin and without, you know, and without Jackie Robinson. Like, like certain, certain things have to happen in a culture before, we, before it changes politically. And, and that, Kevin, I really appreciate because that is a great entry. Like, now we're talking, right? You want, you, you want to change the world? Take a, look at, take a look at these, you know, some of these writers who helped lead the way. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think Nelson Mandela, you know, yeah. read his book. Yeah. yeah. I mean, do we have, do we, I guess it helped that he was in prison and a political leader, but yeah. do we have Nelson Mandela without long walk to freedom? We, no, we really no, don't. I don't think we do. Yeah. 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 I agree. Um, I want to, I want to, I want to ask you what, what, where you see yourself going next uh, now that Maggie Brown is out in the world for all of us to enjoy. And then John, do we have time for Peter to read a little something before we get to questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got okay. a couple of questions here. And if, if folks have more questions, they can feel free to su submit them here in the chat. And I'll ask a selection of them uh, after the reading. Great. So maybe I'll read it. I'll, I'll, I'm going to dodge your question, Kevin, because I don't know what's next. I don't know right. what's next. Good. We'll Good. See. It, it's less we'll interesting see. than, than I, I, I got yeah. some stuff coming, but it's, you know, I, I take a, I, it, it hurts me to it's only you know it feels like if you feel like a faker oh i have this and this no i don't i don't know what i got i don't know what i got uh so this is a story i've actually never read out loud before uh it's a west marin story uh and i just thought i would um try it out on you all um so uh i i appreciate you listening uh it's called the case against bobby and it's a brief story two pages so don't worry <laughs> everybody i really appreciate you all uh, coming out on a, on a busy, busy night um, uh, and where we're all looking forward to uh, or not looking forward to what's about to happen in a few hours or less than a few hours at this point. Case against Bobby. Was embezzlement of her demented mother's bank account. There wasn't any question of fact. She drained it. Someone from the nursing home must have tiffed off the police. The day after the story appeared in the light, she walked to town in the morning like she always did because the old Mercedes that had belonged to her late father no longer ran. It sat in her driveway. Sometimes you'd see her in there taking a nap, the front seat reclined. Every morning she sat in the park and waited for smileys to open. This was when the bar still opened at nine. The new owners, they sleep in. I'd already be there sitting on the bench with a cup of coffee reading the paper, but willing to listen in case Bobby was in the mood to talk. If Bobby was in a good mood, she'd interrupt me and tell me another story about her father, who'd once been a well-known film director, and her mother, who'd been a concert pianist. The house on Lilac was long bought and paid for, though God knows, she'd say, they'll pry it away from me eventually. The day after the story broke, 
She didn't want to talk. Who would? We sat together without speaking. I went back to reading. Who am I to judge anybody for stealing? After a few minutes though, she told me that the night before she'd had a talk with her father's ghost. You know, she said, like in Hamlet. Her father asked her, no, demanded that she go and kidnap the child or no, the grandchild. A grandchild would do the trick even better, her father told her, of one of the studio execs who fleeced him back in the 60s. Kidnap a kid, Bobby said? Like Lindbergh's baby? Lindbergh was a horse's ass, but he didn't deserve that. Or at least that little boy didn't. You ever see his picture? That little blonde Lindbergh boy with the fat face? I said, Papa, I love you with all I've got left, but I'm no kidnapper. I don't even have a ladder. I laughed. And Bobby looked across the street at the bar, which was still closed. There were some mornings for Bobby when getting from 8.45 to 9 took more than an hour. Eventually, they dropped the charges. Her mother, the concert pianist, had left her estate to Bobby. So while it was still technically theft because her mother was absolutely still alive, the DA in San Rafael probably decided that a jury might not convict given that the money would be Bobby's soon enough anyway. It wasn't good precedent, but you had to pick your battles. And as far as the town felt, most people thought, why shouldn't Bobby have the money and not the far bigger thief, in this case, the nursing home? Bobby didn't gloat. She'd sit in the park in the morning like she always did and try not to look at smileys. She started to read the paper again. She never bought her own paper. She'd always ask to look at mine because the last thing Bobby would do would be to walk into John's and buy her own paper. Another morning, a couple of months after her mother died, so we all knew that she was either flush with cash or at least she would be soon. Bobby told me out in the park one morning without preface, she always thought her hands were ugly, my mother but they were too plump. That's why she played box so fast. Not that anybody could see them from that far away in the dark. I dig it, man. That's great. Thanks, Ken. Yeah. All right. Do we have try. some, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I just, that's one of the endings that I, who knows. If that works or not, I, I got no idea, but that's where it ended. I don't know. Anyway. Ah. Um, the first question yeah. from our viewers here is, um, can you speak a little bit about this economy of words you like to achieve? Does that start uh, with an excess of words that you own down? How do you know when you've gotten into the density you so beautifully achieve? I, I, you know, I'm grateful for the question in itself. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, I, I think uh, two things, I think. One is that I, I, writing has always come hard for me. You know, I, I don't, it's not like I write a lot and sculpt down. It, it really is, it's just hard for me to even get a word out. So I, I find that when I do, it's usually pretty tight because that's all I got. That's all I got. Um, and, and then on top of that, then, then I will do, um, a great deal of revising to sort of, you know, get the, get the, try and get the rhythms right. Um, and, you know, I, I, I mean, in some, in some ways I'm trying to, um, not always be that way, you know, and I, I, I have narrators who are, you know, like I've been reading Stanley Elkin later, you know, Stanley Elkin who said, you know, there's two kinds of writers, one, a taker in or a, a taker outer. A put a put in a put her in or a take her outer, and you know there's a lot to be said because there are people in the world who are put her inners, right? And so if I got a character, which I do now, who's a put her inner, I got to be a put her inner, right? So, um, so I'm not married to any one way, but I do find 
as a philosophical matter that I'm offended by too many words. It's just always, I just, I, and I feel like I feel inundated. I go on the, I go on the web. I look in the, I just, I, I just feel like bombarded. And I just feel like, I, I know it's a small thing or, or seems like a small thing, but I think if we choose, if we, if we just were a little more careful about our, our word usage, I, you know, we'd have a new president, things would be better. Yeah. Have, have you ever read right a here. novel? <laughs> have you ever read a novel where you were like, man, that really needs 75 more pages. Like that, like that's really what's exactly. missing here. <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. I mean, maybe housekeeping, maybe it needs it needed 75 more pages, but it just doesn't, it just doesn't right. And it wouldn't, it didn't, it, and, oh. and, you know, but that said, again, there's this, you know, I, I, I try not to be too rigid in my approaches, even when I'm being tight, you know, there is a narrator in this book, his name's Len, and one of the characters, who is a big talker. And I just got to like go with that and, and let the big talker be the big talkers because they also, are, you know, have a certain amount of, um, I don't know where that was going. Yeah. The next question um, from a friend of mine and an avid reader of yours, any plans for a second volume of Am I Alone Here? I love your Believer column and want to have those essays in book form. Oh, uh, I speak in my nonfiction language. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if that came to pass, that, that would be, that would be great. Um, you know, I, 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 I mean, it's, I, I find that doing a column is different than, than a, than a book. And I need to find a way, you know, to, um, to make it, to, to, to those, those, and I really appreciate the question and it's been really fun to work for the believer um i have a certain page limit there and so the originals tend to be honed down and and so i'm kind of working a little bit with figuring out you know how those might actually be a more putter in situation so i appreciate that and you'll be the first to, to know thank you um and then a question here you spoke at the uh, about circling back uh, around to so many unfinished stories to collect Maggie Brown, about how many stories are you generally able to juggle uh, in your head at one time, if multiple at all? It depends. I, they're, in the, they're in my notebooks um, which for some reason, because I've been moving around. My notebook's always with me, but it's not with me right now. Uh, but yeah, I could do, you know, let's say six, seven, eight. I mean, I've always got certain things. And again, that maybe, maybe it shows in my stuff. You know, if I could just focus a little better, there'd be that one, you know what I mean? So, but, but I, I do like, I, I've always had multiple characters jumbling around in my head and um, I, I used to fight that. I used to fight it. And uh, I think, I guess what I'd say just in terms of what I, how, how I sort of came out of this book is I figured I'm just going to be myself. I'm just gonna, you know, it's going to be a peripatetic collection. Um, and hope they speak to each other. And I think Kevin raised this earlier, and I would just say, you know, if there's a thematic connection, and I believe there is, you know, it's memory and, and sort of how we, how memory shapes the lives, the, the stories we tell ourselves, you know, and I'm just fascinated by that across culture, across years. I'm just very interested in how my, my characters deal with what they remember. And that, that, that's always been my subject and probably will continue to be. Um, here's a question here. Uh, Peter, I attended a class that you gave on Joseph Mitchell and the art of listening, where you discussed Mitchell's technique of wandering around and picking things up, finding material outside of himself. He also took us through an exercise of listening carefully to syntax, diction, and silence. I think many of us perhaps are experiencing a good deal more silence in our lives these days and fewer occasions for overhearing language spoken in the open by strangers. Is your experience of writing speech or imagining the language of others changing now during this time? That's a beautiful question. I, I remember that class and I remember the syntax example that I think I gave was Mayor Daly, the old man, the original Mayor Daly, Mayor of Chicago once said, and I quote, no man is in Ireland. <laughs> uh, that is syntax for you. He said a lot of things. He said a lot of things he shouldn't have said, like, you know, shoot, shoot, shoot looters to kill and shit like that. But uh, he, he had some funny ones too. Uh, and Joseph Mitchell is one of the great listeners. I think, I think that attached to Mitchell was um, 
was Anna Devere Smith. And I was putting them together in terms of like, in my opinion, you know, two wonderful listeners of, of the way, not just what people say, but the way they say it, you know? And so, yeah, I, 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 I find, I mean, I live in Vermont. We're like, very self-congratulatory about how well we're doing. So we're starting to open up. I'm, I'm starting, I'm getting back in there. And there's always ways to listen to people talk, you know? Um, and I, uh, I'm always, always uh, hungry for that and always on the lookout and constantly listen. But definitely this has cramped, not only cramped my style, it's been very kind of sad to see how hermetically sealed, um, you know, we can exist. And that, I think that's, partly a testament to our strength, but a partly um, kind of sad how, how cut off we are. And, and, and I wonder, will that carry over? Or will we suddenly, you know, will there be less sort of, you know, banter among strangers? Um, I doubt it, but, but I, I am a little concerned how people look away from each other, you know, um, in a knee jerk way. And, and even I'm in supermarket and I'm, I usually linger because I, I want to hear stuff and people are, rushing through that. So it's definitely um, affected the stories that I collect, but maybe for better or for worse, there's still people who are congregating and talking in public, as you all know. <laughs> so, um, and I, I'm, I'm in the fire department here. It was actually just an accident, pretty bad accident on the highway, which I couldn't attend because I'm with you all. But uh, I, I do get a lot of um, uh, good talk from uh, my firefighter colleagues. So uh, I, I, I go out of my way to make sure that I'm with people who are still talking to each other. So. I think we've got time for, for one more question. Um, and that is, uh, um, how do you keep from getting discouraged about writing and words on your toughest days? Today was one of those. I lied down on the floor of a little studio in, a, in an old hotel in, in a, a couple towns uh, away from where I live. And uh, I, that's what I did. I lied on the floor. <laughs> so, you know, I, I always, I mean, I hear some practical and very maybe cliche advice, but I always find the bad days if I, if I hang out or, or if I walk around or if I read the bad day. And then if I show up the next day, wherever it is in my head or at the, you know, in the little place that I work, it usually goes better. And so today was, a today was, I literally, I think I wrote, you know, half a paragraph and then I, I, was, I don't know, I was just tired and I lied down on the floor. I was like, and I thought to myself, like, I need a pillow. I need like a, how about a thermo rest? Like, why not three years in this place? I have nothing like that. Um, so, uh, you know, I always feel like you put that time in, don't dwell on it tomorrow. You're going to have another sentence. And I, I, I honestly, I tell it to my students and I tell it to myself and it's true. Uh, you know, it's that it's the over the long haul. And I know Kevin knows this having, you know, with his books is, uh, you know, not every day is going to be going to be anything. Most days aren't, but I think that you pay for the, the good days by the bad days. I've, I've just always believe to get again and apologies for the how cliche that sounds well uh we've reached the top of the hour i've just put a link in the chat again where you can purchase uh peter and kevin's books from literati bookstore uh peter and kevin thank you so much for joining at home with literati tonight we appreciate it so much um and thank you for a really lovely conversation and reading and we hope to have you both um into back to the the home of your soul in arbor <laughs> michigan uh real soon and um until then please continue to stay safe and be well and to all of our guests thank you for for joining us and we hope to see you at the next event so take care everybody good thank to see you, you very Appreciate much you, john thank you kevin really and good to Thanks, see man. familiar names and and uh can I say one thing, John? I drove yeah. the YMCA. I drove the YMCA van for the the, the Main Street YMCA down there, uh, which nobody should have let me do that at the age I was in. But anyway, real pleasure to 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 meet you and and thank you for what you do and the store oh, keeping it running for us. So I appreciate Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Take care. We'll see you soon. You Thanks all. again, Kevin. Talk to you, see soon. you soon. Good to see you, Brian. And and see Kevin's movie, Final <laughs> Nation. It was really nice of you. Final Nation. I should, we should have mentioned that earlier, <laughs> not when we were closing. Well, John mentioned it, but it's a fantastic documentary about uh, records and, and how they are still on the radar. And I, I can't, you know, it's, I can't recommend it enough. Thanks, man. Always Take a pleasure care. to see you and read your books.
Good to see bye you, bye. brother.